Now, oxygen's in the air we breathe. It's what makes iron rust. It makes our blood turn red. Now, right here, we have a piece of iron, which is steel wool, and we're going to run some electrons through it and make it react with the oxygen in the air. It's pretty dramatic. Oh. Yeah, see how it glows orange? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Glowing pretty good. But over here, we have a plastic chamber that's full of oxygen and another piece of steel wool. Now watch what happens now. Pretty cool. See all the energy that's given off? And the energy's given off because the electrons are recombining with other electrons, making a chemical reaction. So in this reaction, energy is being given off. And in this reaction, we ran energy through the water, and it separated into hydrogen and oxygen. Now, what would happen if we let these two recombine? We should get water again, right? But we should also get a little energy. Well, we can do that. Because in this balloon, we have hydrogen and oxygen mixed together. And when they recombine, we'll get just a little bit of water vapor, which will end up in the room someplace. And we should get a lot of energy. You ready? Three, two, one! <laughs> now that's a chemical reaction. And now for another really big chemical reaction. So people made up a story about a guy named uh, Zeus who lived in the clouds and every once in a while he threw a bolt of lightning down to the earth. It seemed like a pretty good explanation, so people believed it for a long time. But it turns out, it's even wilder than that. Lightning is caused by tiny pieces of stuff called electrons, and they rub on each other until huge amounts of energy build up in clouds, and then zap, lightning bolts come down to the Earth. Ha! Huh. Anyway, just because something is unexplained doesn't mean that it's psychic, or magic, or mystic. It just means that we can't explain it right now. But trying to find answers to things we don't understand is, is part of being human. It's human nature. It's, it's why we have science. And I guess it's probably why we, why we have pseudoscience. Did you know that white light is a mixture of all the colors of the rainbow? It is. Now, white light's hitting this basketball, but all we see is orange. And white light's hitting this blue gelatin dessert, but all we see is blue gelatin. Now my coat, well, it's got lots of colors. Hey, it's the show about light and color. Now without different colors of light, we couldn't see different colored things. And of course without light, well, we couldn't have a TV show. Oh, oh funny, oh very funny. You can turn the lights on now, turn the lights on. Hey, stick on my foot. Sorry, sorry. I got it, I got it. Now this is the plastic water-filled prism of science. And shining into it is a bright white light. Now when white light goes into a prism, it breaks up into all the colors of the rainbow, what we call the full spectrum of colors. So down here is the spectrum being made by the prism of science. See, here are all the colors of the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and purple, or violet. Now watch. I'm going to try to break these colors up using another prism. Red, yellow, green, blue, and violet. See, they can't be broken up anymore. What that means is these are pure colors. White light is a mixture of all the colors of the spectrum, but each color is its own color. White light is colorful. What gives fruits and vegetables all their different colors? I don't know. Well, chemicals in the skin of the fruit and vegetable absorb and reflect different wavelengths of light. Take this orange. It's absorbing all the colors of light except orange, which it's reflecting. This green apple, it's reflecting green, absorbing the other colors. The red pepper, it's reflecting red and absorbing the other colors except red. 
Bet you didn't know I could... Bet you didn't know I could juggle. I gotta do it first bit. Gotta get these colors flying. Oh, yeah. Sure. Sure, there it is. Sure. Look at all those colors. It's chemicals reflecting and absorbing white light from the sun. What a party! What a party! Consider the following. There's an old saying in science. We don't see things. We see light bouncing off of things. So when you see my tie, you're seeing light from the lab that hits the tie and goes into the camera and works its way to your eye. Now, here in the lab, we have almost perfectly white light. We have almost all the colors of the spectrum. But when you look at my tie, it looks black with just a few brightly colored spots. What's happening to all the other colors? Where are they going? I don't know. Well, they're getting absorbed and turning into heat. You may have noticed this. In a bright light or in the sun, a black cloth feels slightly warmer, yeah, slightly warmer than a white cloth. That's because the black cloth is absorbing almost all the colors of light that hit it and changing them to heat, whereas the white cloth is reflecting almost all the colors. This is how paint works. Paint absorbs light. Paint has little particles in it called pigment. So red paint is absorbing most of the light that hits it and reflecting red. Yellow is absorbing most of the light and reflecting yellow. And blue paint absorbs most of the colors and reflects blue. Now, when we mix the colors of light, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, we get white light. But when we mix different colors of paint, it doesn't work that way. Red, yellow, and blue. And blue. The bottle's giving up. Uh-huh and blue. Okay. And blue. When they're mixed, they don't turn white. They turn kind of a messy brown. That's because it's absorbing light. Well, there's a lot of things in nature that absorb almost all the colors of light that hit them. Like charcoal. Or this dog. <laughs> oh. Red things, like these red clothes, absorb all colors of light except red. Blue. Yellow. Green. They reflect red light. White reflects all colors. Blue, yellow, red, green. Come on, hit me with all you got. Do you realize that every living thing on Earth has been changing for the last three billion years? That's why we're all so different. Well, we are different. But as different as we all are, we all have a lot in common because we're all made of the same few basic chemicals. Now this process, this uh, thing that happens, is called evolution. <laughs> and it's been going on for billions of years. Isn't that wild? <laughs> See, the copy looks just like the original, but not exactly like it. There are some small differences because there's some small changes that happen every time you make a copy. The same thing happens when living things make copies of themselves, like when they have children. See, the children of living things are always different from their parents, but not completely different. I mean, they're related. They have the same genes. Now, genes are made of a very complicated chemical called deoxyribonucleic acid. Deoxyribonucleic acid. Deoxyribonucleic acid. We usually just call it DNA. 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 The genes of you and me, giraffes, fish, seaweed, our genes are all made of DNA. DNA. We're all made of the same basic chemicals. We're all made of DNA. Dinosaur genes are made of DNA. So you and I are the product of billions, billions of years, billions of years of tiny changes, tiny changes to our DNA. They happen every time living things make copies of themselves. Like every time we have children, when your grandparents had your parents, and when your parents had you. This process of change is called evolution. It's the reason we all look the way we look. Hi there.
What if I told you that the Fun 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 Fest is the funnest festival on the face of the earth? And I can prove it using the science of fun. I know what you're thinking, science of fun. I mean, is that even real? <laughs> of course it is. After all, I'm Bill Nye the science man. <clears throat> now, science can be used to measure anything. Force, vectors, mass, how much your brain shrinks every time you use a selfie stick. But you can also use science to measure fun. Now let's start with one of the most basic forms of fun measurement. The quantitative fun observation, or QFO. Now this graph depicts some of the QFOs present at your average fun, fun, fun fest. You got D'Angelo's abs, a wrestling ring, the super collider skate ramp, official makeout zones, a chance of Ray Shemurd, the fun, fun funnel cakes, and as you can see, this resulting trajectory is a sharp ascent into a word I refuse to say. Other festivals suffer because of certain quantitative bummer observations, or QBOs. They're depicted on this graph. You'll find old guys in Crocs, drum circles, foo fighting, floppy hats, falling asleep at the wheel. These are all things where zero funds are awarded. These QBOs ensure you'll head toward, but never reach any levels of fun. So we call this relationship asymptotic. And you know what I say about asymptotes. They make an ass out of oops and, and totes. It's kind of a <laughs> science gag there. <clears throat> now let's not forget about the lexical boost. This equation proves that the name of a festival significantly enhances fun vibes. Fun, fun, fun fest has the word fun in the title, count them, one, two, three times. So three funds is a lexical boost of three times 8%, which is 24% margin of fun per metric ton. It's literally tons of fun. Now, in this quadrant, we don't see the word fun anywhere. Maybe it's uh, behind the chalkboard. <laughs> no, not just that, there's gum. People, you have to put gum on the blackboard. Crying out loud. <clears throat> and now we turn to a scientist's most crucial ally. I refer, of course, to the Venn diagram. Now, any festival goer will tell you that their three favorite things are tacos, convenience, and tacos. Now, this overlapping area represents Fun 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 Fest's 12 chamber taco cannon, promising you a very large amount of fun, measured in units. Uh, I'm not really familiar with the uh, butt load, but I can assure you it's a, it's a, lot, it's a lot of fun. <clears throat> and then finally, it was Dmitry Mendeleev who first discovered the woo factor, which states that fun grows exponentially by the amount of naturally occurring woo elements or woo laments that appear at a festival. You'll have uh, Riza, Jizza, Inspecta Deck, Ray Kwan, Cappadonna, you God, Ghostface Killa, Master Killa, and Method Man. There's a high probability that they're all going to be at this year's Fun 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 Fest. So scientifically speaking, that ain't nothing to f*** with. All right? So, in conclusion, the evidence is undeniable. Fun 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 Fest is the funnest festival on the face of the earth because science is always right. And climate change is real. We'll see you at the Super Collider. Oh wait, that's uh, that's one of the that's one of the makeout zones. And once again, it's mostly guys. Just like just like when I was in engineering school. Now look around and count how many different things there are. Yeah, count everything. There's tires and tubas. There's kids and cows. There's wood and there's forests. There's fish in the sea. There's stars in the sky. There's even kitchen sinks. You can count thousands, millions, billions of things. We call all of this stuff matter. And it turns out that if we break matter down, take it completely apart, all of these things are made of just a few things. We call them atoms. That's from a Greek word that means uncuttable. Atoms are too small to see, 
even with a regular microscope like this. Here is a model, a first look at an atom. Now here are the main parts. Well, they're particles. Parts, particles, get it? <laughs> anyway, in the middle are very heavy particles. And buzzing around the middle are very light particles. Now if we could see an atom, it couldn't look anything like this because atoms are mostly empty. It's just the nucleus, the middle of an atom. Now in here are two kinds of particles, protons and neutrons. No one knows what they would really look like. The protons have a positive electrical charge, like a spark. And the neutrons have no charge. They're neutral. They just hang out in the nucleus. Now, buzzing around the outside of the nucleus are very small particles called electrons. Maybe you've heard of them. In fact, the flow of electrons from one atom to another is called electricity. Science! Thank you all. It's so good to see you. Uh, unlike, uh, I believe, all of my colleagues, I am an engineer. I mean, <laughs> let me emphasize, um, like my colleagues, I'm a human, uh, but uh, engineer. And may maybe some of you saw that right away. Uh, people recognize you at parties. Hey, you're an engineer. Uh, your pants don't reach the floor, that's how <laughs> you can tell. Hey, listen, man, can you fix the blender? <laughs> I mean, you're the engine. Yeah, yeah, I can fix the blender. Here's what you do. Uh, hold the plug in the wall firmly. <laughs> and then uh, just hold the blender motor under some cold running water. <laughs> now, see, that's funny if you're scientifically literate. <laughs> So my older brother, tremendous influence on me, had a wonderful physics teacher, Woodrow Wilson High School, Washington, D.C. And he told my brother the story who told me the story. Michael Faraday, in uh, 1828, then uh, through 1831, would do the Christmas lectures at, uh, in London, which is back east someplace. And <laughs> he did this demonstration where he had a coil of wire on one end of a laboratory bench connected to another coil of wire by two wires, the, the terminal wires of the coils. So he goes down here with a bar magnet, reasonably powerful magnet, which you could find in those days, and moves it, if I may, in and out of the coil uh, <laughs> with respect to the coil. <laughs> and then... Here's the thing, you know, I was in college, okay? <laughs> and I, I don't want to trouble you, I know there are a lot of grown-ups here and stuff, but you, that never goes away. <laughs> that, it's always, it's still funny. <laughs> the X, 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 Y, X, X, it's still there. So he moves the magnet at this end of the table, and the compass needle moves at this end as if by magic. Uh, but of course, it wasn't magic, it was... Science! Science! Yes. <laughs> so the story was embellished, and it was presented to me that he did this demonstration with such success so often that he presented it to the Queen of England. And the Queen of England is supposed to have said to him, Mr. Faraday, of what use is it? And here's where I just admire the guy, and I admire what we in the United States perceive as the British uh, way of thinking. He did not say, lady! <laughs> what? Are you, what? Are you, would you look? That's at that end, I'm at this, I'm not touching it. <laughs> what? Are you high? I mean, come on. <laughs> I love it. You like your ass, okay? But, but that's not what he said. <laughs> According to the story, he said, Madam, of what use is a newborn babe? Now, I don't know how much time you have spent uh, with newborn babes, but they're not that useful. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're loud, 
and they leak. And there's a lot of times they don't seem to understand a word you say to them. But with that said, everybody, first of all, I mean, looking with all due respect, uh, it was King George the Fourth at first, and then it was William the Fourth. So there was no queen involved. Uh, and it, when I did the Science Guy show, we had a, a researcher who was very diligent about this, and it was he never presented to the monarch. He, presented some woman, a, a normal person, came up to him and asked him this question. But look around, everybody. Everything in this room, everything, the lights, the curtains, the paint, the clothes you're wearing, the upholstery, the floor, the stage, everything here owes its existence to that discovery, to the discovery that not only is there a connection between electricity and magnetism, but there's a connection between electricity and the moving of the magnetism, the flux. And that discovery, dare I say it, changed the world. <laughs> but this is, this process of science that this guy spent, I guess, he, he took tremendous pride in his demonstrations and he really perfected this to show it to people. This discovery uh, had a deep effect on me. Now, when I was, uh, a kid, I delivered the newspaper. I was a paper boy. They were, uh, that was the title. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in the Washington Post on Sundays, there'd be Ripley's Believe It or Not. And it was still there. Uh, it was a different paper, but still there. And it would say from time to time, they would run the story roughly, according to aerodynamic three theory, bumblebees cannot fly. And this made quite an impression on me. And I spent some time watching bumblebees. And it became clear to me that the bees are fine. <laughs> the, the problem is with the theory. So I wonder, continually, I wonder how many things are right under our nose that we just don't know anything about. I had a uh, Sky Streak airplane, which are still manufactured, and uh, the older boys showed me how to lubricate the rubber motor with dishwashing soap, and I wound that thing up, man. I wound up that rubber band, and I got that thing wound up 300, 350 turns, man. And I read on the back of the package that you can steer the aircraft by bending the, hor the vertical tail, the, the rudder, making a rudder, sort of. <sighs> Bend. <sighs> now, okay, this is an eyewitness account, and it's from one guy. You, you, eyewitness accounts are imperfect, and this is the way I remember it, okay? <laughs> now, most of the time when you operate these aircraft, if you've ever tried it, it's two hands, you throw it <laughs> like that. Or you throw it and poof, like that. But one time I threw it and it made three perfect circles. And it came right back to my hand like, like a boomerang with Bugs Bunny or something. And then I realized that I could influence objects. I realized that if you could understand things enough, you could make things and shape things and imagine traveling around the world. And you could do it with a balsa wood airplane. Just think what you could do if you worked for a big company, like Boeing. And that's what I ended up doing. Uh, I worked on 747s. Uh, I, I, relax, everybody. I was very well supervised. <laughs> but these things that happen to you when you're a little kid influence you so much. And I'll bet you everybody in here is a science enthusiast, got excited about it before you were 10 years old. And this passion, this, this drive to know our place in the universe is what makes us special. It's what makes our species worthy. And with this PB&J, this passion, beauty, and joy, <laughs> we can, dare I say it, change the world! Thank you.
engineers, you people! Humans weren't always riding rockets. For tens of thousands of years, humans did all their space exploration from the Earth, looking up at points of light in the night sky. A few hundred years ago, people had the idea to use a magnifier, a telescope to look at the sky. And when they did, they saw that some of the points of light that look like stars are actually planets. They have different colors. And some of them even have moons going around them, the same way our Earth does. Space is huge, it's vast, and it's where we live. Why do our rockets that go up in space have to be so big? Well, please consider the fall. It's our hot rod on a string of science. Uh, it's a car. And one end of a string is tied to it. And the other end is tied to this ball. Now, gravity pulls down on the ball. And the ball pulls down on the string. And the string pulls on the car and pulls it toward the center of the model. The center of the model pulling on the car. Now, here's the thing. Space is only 300 kilometers from here, only uh, 200 nautical miles from here. So if we could drive a car at, say, uh, 100 kilometers an hour for three hours, well, we'd end up out in space. And I guess we'd pull over and park. But we can't do that. You know why? Because gravity will pull the car right back down. Right back down. Right back down. So here's what we do. We get our rocket ships moving. Now the car wants to go up this way in a straight line. This way. And gravity is pulling the car that way. So what ends up happening is the two forces are in balance. The car goes around in a circle. The same thing happens with our spaceships going around the Earth. They end up in orbit. To get rockets into space, we need a huge amount of fuel. We need a gas tank five times bigger than a spacecraft. That's because gravity is holding our rockets down, keeping our rockets from leaving the Earth until we get them to blast off. things all the time. That's how we compare one thing to another. Measuring things is how we understand the world. And especially, it's how we understand our place on it. Measuring things allows us to figure out how long it takes to get from one place to another. If we didn't measure things, everything we build would fall right down. The better we measure, the better things fit. Every post, every beam, every pillar, every pipe, and every wire is planned. We know where they're all going to go because we measure them beforehand, and we measure them as we put it together. The more carefully we measure, the more accurately we can make things and make things fit, like airplane parts. Humans and chimpanzees parted company in evolution about six million years ago from a common ancestor. The human genome and the chimpanzee genome have both been completely sequenced. And this is a small section of part of the genome that matches. If we follow along here, human chimp, go all the way along here, all the way along here, they're all identical. Differences between the two are indicated by a little man who is in fact Svante Parbo, a very distinguished Swedish geneticist now working in Germany. It's a little game of find Parbo. Follow along this row here, chimp, human, chimp, human, identical, identical, identical. There's a difference. Walk along, walk along, walk along, all the same, all the same, identical, no difference at all between the human and the chimpanzee. Exactly the same, exactly the same. Now we see another difference there. A versus G. Walk along, walk along, walk along and there are no more differences in that whole row. 
almost all of the human genome and the chimpanzee genome is identical. A tiny number of differences account for all the really quite large differences that we see between humans and chimpanzees. Cool. See all the energy that's given off? And the energy's given off because the electrons are recombining with other electrons, making a chemical reaction. So in this reaction, energy's being given off. And in this reaction, we ran energy through the water, and it's separated into hydrogen and oxygen. Now, what would happen if we let these two recombine? We should get water again, right? But we should also get a little energy. Well, we can do that. Because in this balloon, we have hydrogen and oxygen mixed together. And when they recombine, we'll get just a little bit of water vapor, which will end up in the room someplace. And we should get a lot of energy. You ready? Three, two, one! <laughs> Now that's a chemical reaction. And now for another really big chemical reaction. So people made up a story about a guy named uh, Zeus who lived in the clouds and every once in a while he threw a bolt of lightning down to the earth. It seemed like a pretty good explanation, so people yeah. believed it for a long time. But it turns out it's even wilder than that. Lightning is caused by tiny pieces of stuff called electrons, and they rub on each other until huge amounts of energy build up in clouds and then zap, lightning bolts come down to the earth. Ha! Huh. Anyway, just because something is unexplained doesn't mean that it's psychic or magic or mystic. It just means that we can't explain it right now. But trying to find answers to things we don't understand is it's part of being human. It's human nature. It's, it's why we have science. I guess it's probably why we, why we have pseudoscience. Did you know that white light is a mixture of all the colors of the rainbow? It is. White light's hitting this basketball, but all we see is orange. And white light's hitting this blue gelatin dessert, but all we see is blue gelatin. Now my coat, well, it's got lots of colors. Hey, it's the show about light and color. Now, without different colors of light, we couldn't see different colored things. And of course, without light, well, we couldn't have a TV show. Oh, oh, funny. Oh, very funny. Bam, bam, bam. Bill Nye, the science guy. Now, oxygen's in the air we breathe. It's what makes iron rust, it makes our blood turn red. Now, right here, we have a piece of iron, which is steel wool, and we're going to run some electrons through it and make it react with the oxygen in the air. It's pretty dramatic. Oh. Yeah, see how it glows orange? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Glowing pretty good. But over here, we have a plastic chamber that's full of oxygen and another piece of steel wool. Now, watch what happens now. You can turn the lights on now. Turn the lights on. Sorry, sorry. Ah, I got it, I got it. Now this is the plastic water-filled prism of science. And shining into it is a bright white light. Now when white light goes into a prism, it breaks up into all the colors of the rainbow, what we call the full spectrum of colors. So down here, is the spectrum being made by the prism of science. See, here are all the colors of the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and purple, or violet. Now watch. I'm going to try to break these colors up using another prism. <laughs> 